I am thrilled to be joined today by Tatiana Bolton, Security Policy Manager at Google and Senior Advisor to the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Um, so I want to start with some things that you're doing in your role at Google. I know that Google has been busy since earlier in the summer, rolling out a number of initiatives geared toward increasing talent in cybersecurity. I've seen um, things including a specialized Google certificate in cybersecurity, preparing people for entry-level jobs, a new research program with universities in New York, and committing more than $20 million to help students get hands-on experience through a series of cybersecurity clinics. I know it's still early for some of those, but can you tell us a little bit more about the ones you're most excited about and how they're going so far? Yeah, so these are some of uh, my most uh, you know, uh, sort of passion projects, if you will. I love uh, working on this on this issue because I think it's so critical to cybersecurity uh, on on the whole. I think a lot of people uh, focus on any number of issues, including vulnerability disclosure, cloud security, uh, et cetera. And I think all of those have a workforce element to them, which is why I think uh, addressing this issue and and talking about it is so important. Uh, the the work that you mentioned, uh, all of it, I'm very excited about. I think it is a it's an effort to have a comprehensive approach to cybersecurity workforce issues, because no one program or project can ever really fix this program or fix this issue in its entirety. Uh, I think if anybody tells you that, they're just, you know they're lying. Uh, there, it's such a stubborn problem. It's been around uh, for a while. Uh, you know, we. We have 650,000 openings in cyber uh, in cyber jobs. Uh, that number has continued to to grow, and so we try we're trying to address it from a number of different ways. Right, building more pathways into cybersecurity, increasing the education, the training for cyber professionals, and then also just the broader public, uh, and then also helping with curriculum uh, curriculum and resources for learners. So uh, as you mentioned, we're doing, we just in May released the cyber, uh, cyber certificates, which uh, we're very excited about. Uh, those are available right now um, online and they are helping students get access to education uh, on cybersecurity from Google experts who have been doing this for a really long time. We have a great lineup of people in that, uh, in that certificate that train the, train the students on cybersecurity. We, I'm also extremely excited about the work that's happening in uh, in New York, where we have committed uh, over twelve million dollars to research work on on and a, on curriculum on cybersecurity. I think it's you know th there are a lot of issues there that need to be addressed, including, for example, how cybersecurity is not yet a uh, cybersecurity is not yet a requirement in all computer science curricula across the country or the world. So, you know, we're trying to help that by developing more research, uh, getting organization and, and universities working together to try and figure out what a curriculum uh, should look like in cyber or, you know, ex expanding on the existing work uh, that a lot of uh, great organizations have already done. And then uh, lastly, uh, the cyber clinics program, which, uh, which I've uh, worked on or or have been tangentially um, uh, connected with for for the last five years or so, and that's from the Cyberspace Solarium Commission work uh, all the way all the way to Google. The clinics are a really fantastic model to try and get hands on learning to students because right now what we have is this sort of pipeline that trains some group of people in cyber, right? People who think people who are going to like a computer science program uh, at a university, but there's also a lot of people who aren't going to universities. And then we've got, and then we've got the, uh, you know, offices, the companies that need cybersecurity expertise and the jobs, but there's a squishy middle between the, the learning that's happening either through certs or universities and the actual job. And what, the the real need here is the this hands-on learning piece the piece that actually connects students and their uh and their classroom learning to actual positions where you need experience and hands-on and, and hands-on uh experience to actually get that position and so clinics uh are, are a fantastic way to do that 
based out of universities with the support of a faculty member, students uh, work with community organizations in their city or their state, and they help them develop things like a cyber risk assessment or a strategy or um, you know, any number of cyber policies that an organization might need. And the org so it's a win-win. The organization gets cyber support that they wouldn't otherwise get because they are under-resourced as, you know, uh, as a general whole, small businesses, state and local uh, organizations are really under-resourced for cyber. And so they get help. And then the on the other side, the students get, ha get hands-on training. And so it helps both sides. And that's why I'm such a fan of that, that program. But, you know, at Google, we're doing a number of these programs because not one, not no one of them alone will fix the issue. Yeah, I think that kind of brings up a good point and a question I have around, you know, Google has the ability and is really leading the charge on a lot of these initiatives by focusing on that pipeline and how we can take a dent in that large gap that continues to grow in cybersecurity positions. But beyond it being certainly not a one size fit all, what are some of the other challenges that you see from a policy perspective to try and scale some of these great initiatives to make a little bit more substantive progress because that number seems to be increasing at a pace faster than we're able to even come up with some of these solutions? Yeah, uh, totally, totally right. And I will say, you know, just at a, at a higher level, Google believes in sort of a comprehensive approach to security. Um, through open and secure frameworks that foster collaboration, innovation, um, sharing solutions freely to resolve vulnerabilities, uh, and then and then creating secure by default uh, products, services that embed the protections, making everything secure by default. So that is the the basis, if you will, for the way we think about workforce uh, in cyber as well. And what I think that there's there's issues in the very early learning space, right? K to 12, not having enough, uh, yeah. not having enough focus, not having enough resources. There's the issue of that squishy middle I mentioned between the classroom learning or the cert learning and actual jobs, right? So getting people in the door, I think that's a huge problem. That's why we've actually focused, why we've chosen to focus on that particular area, uh, because in the you know, uh, between in all of that, and then including the issues with retention, uh, the that piece about getting people in the door with sufficient training and experience, I think that's the that's the big issue. But I, longer term, I also will add, the K to twelve piece is really is really critical because if you are if you don't have enough of a population that's even knowledgeable about the basics from an early age, they don't. They, they can't, they're, they're not sort of inspired to go into cybersecurity and fix these problems, right? Yeah. No, if you're not, you're not even seeing cybersecurity professionals until you're older, you're not really thinking about that as a career path. And that, right. so that needs to change. Um, I see that, by the way, I see that in my own personal experience. I have a five-year-old in kindergarten and security is absolutely not in that curriculum. And to be perfectly right. honest, I don't think that the school is equipped to implement it, even if one were just handed to them on a silver platter. Yeah, I mean, and so like, that's a, exactly like we have, we want to do this, but like, still people are not out there. They're not really the cyber, like there's not enough cyber experts to go into every school in America and say, hey, I do cybersecurity for a living. What does that look like? Oh, well, I'm a, you know, security researcher or, oh, I do policy in cyber or I'm a comms yeah. person in cybersecurity. And what do those jobs look like? And what does that, you know, what does that even mean? Most people are like, you do what again? Right. <laughs> which is, you know, uh, which is, which is great in 2023. But, uh, but also it's like, <laughs> but there's also the problem of, um, like not enough teachers too, right? So the teachers also, yeah. I, you know, you can't put it on them. They're like massively um, overwhelmed as it is. They they do such great work with our kids. I have four, so you know, I'm well acquainted with the <laughs> with the with teachers and how hard they work. And uh, putting that on them is also very difficult. So like, you know, just getting them trained in this and showing like how how to add case studies into an elementary school program and curricula, right? That's just a whole nother issue. You. Uh, they don't even have enough teachers or professors at the college level, right? Let alone K to 12. And so we've just, I think, you know, part of this is a, you know, I don't want to be too negative about it. I think part of it is a, 
uh, just growing pains of a profession that's really only been around for, you know, at most 50 years. Uh, you know, we've only had the internet for, for what, how long, right? When DARPA created it. So it's, it's not surprising, I think that we're here, but I think it is really important that we focus on it and invest resources to try and address the issue, uh, that we raise awareness that, w that policymakers are prioritizing, uh, real changes. Cause I think for me, it's, it's, you know, the best thing is not just, um, not just, you know, having panels and uh, podcasts, which are amazing to drive awareness, but also getting policymakers to pick tangible outcome driven uh, proposals that can work and include those into, you know, we've seen this in the national cyber strategy, the, the ONCD, the office of the national cyber director, very much focusing on cyber workforce, getting people skilled in cyber, uh, their, the, their recent launch event, uh, and the white house, uh, fact sheet about it had a lot of different actual, like tactical, um, programs and support for particular people within the pipeline, uh, including like educators, universities, um, professionals, et cetera. So I think you're seeing some of it happen. And I think, you know, with the creation of the national cyber director's office, you're, you know, you're getting a focus, like a, like a, uh, us based focus on this, um, or I'm sorry, whole of us, uh, focus on this, but, uh, more, just more needs to be done. Do you see anything coming out beyond the national cybersecurity workforce strategy? I know that's under ONCD at the executive branch level, but given the situation in the legislative branch, I mean, are we at a point that this will translate into anything we can take a whole of government approach and see I mean, some well, I've seen, I've seen bills, uh, fr uh, from lawmakers on cyber workforce, either to invest in cybersecurity training, which is great, or in I've, I've seen a bill on clinics to try and I increase the amount of clinics uh, across the country. NSA has also just recently funded four additional clinics. There's also the philanthropy community that I think should absolutely step up here and like help to establish some of this infrastructure that that's needed, um, for, for training, for, uh, connecting students with uh, or connecting uh, graduates with jobs, uh, building out this sort of infrastructure of internships, apprenticeships, uh, fellowships, uh, clinics that can get students actual the actual experience they need to get into the field at the beginning, or also transition. Uh, Google.org gave a, a donation to uh, a number of veterans groups to to do cybersecurity training and help them transition into cybersecurity because that's another great area right like just look outside of what we currently have and look at people who are trained but just in other uh professions and see how we can get them in and so i think um i think the philanthropy community can play a role there i think companies obviously have a responsibility and you know we're obviously uh, we are eager to help and partner with governments to do more work here um, and then, you know, uh, I, I think the implementation plan from ONCD and the work that CISA has been doing, getting out there, talking about cyber workforce, Jenny Easterly, of course, has gone out and uh, is a big presence uh, in the ecosystem, encouraging and inspiring women and girls to go into cybersecurity, which I think is fantastic, just trying to um, you know, elevate the profession of cybersecurity and make it hip and cool. Um, because we are, you know, hip and cool people. Absolutely. Me, yes. Obviously. <laughs> I mean, so of course. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's it's so interesting because when you talk about all these amazing initiatives that are happening across the industry, including what Google's doing to increase the pipeline and, that you know, not only the pipeline of cyber talent, but even more diverse cyber talent, it always strikes me that it's it's not possible to think about that pipeline unless you create room within organizations to allow for those new candidates to actually come into entry level positions and kind of upskill or give a path for those who there who are who are there in the companies already. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious if there's anything even just anecdotally you can share about how Google thinks about talent in a retention sense because if you don't have a way to retain and pathway people it's hard to to kind of create a world where we can take that entry level talent and actually grow them into the roles. Yeah, well, so Google does a lot like it helps us significantly with 
growing our expertise. We've got, you know, great support to get training and, uh, and upskill, try new positions at Google. So those are all, I think, best of practices uh, or, or best practices that Google, you know, currently uses. But I think just generally, you know, we need to, we need to make sure that we are uh, thinking about, like you're talking about the issue of people coming in the door and like the, some of the requirements, I think there's a number of things we could do there, right? Um, you know, we've got bachelor's degree requirements, uh, CISSP requirements, five years of experience for entry level positions. That's just silly. And I think we've been yeah. talking about this for a long time, but it is in, inherent on uh, the people who are ho doing the hiring to take that in and really do strategic assessments of their uh, of their um, uh, hiring documents and the position descriptions to determine whether a CISSP is actually needed for an entry level position or if you could actually do better for your organization as a whole by bringing in more entry level talent, helping them, mentoring them. Obviously, that's a really critical component. You can't like bring on entry level talent, and not help them along, not do the training because that you know, presents a number of issues. But if, you've, if you're committed to the mentorship and the training piece, if you bring in the entry level talent, you can get, uh, you can really help a person grow their career and it, and it allows them to grow, develop as a, uh, as a professional with room for, you know, with room for growth, right? So you don't always, I think in DC, you see this a lot in the federal government, everybody's like a 13, 14, they're senior level policy yeah. people, right? They're senior level technical people. Uh, there's very, there's almost very little room at the, at the beginning. I think we need to address the structural underlying issues, uh, such as those position descriptions, the, you know, uh, the, the fact that managers are in, are eager to, to get, um, eager to get experienced talent. So we need to address those types of things, uh, to make sure that it's easy or easier for organizations to hire that entry level person professional right and make sure the requirements are reasonable and then to your point on retention yeah absolutely like it's you need to have i think culture plays a big role in this too pretend like you've got to have a good yeah. culture in order to retain your talent you need to give people room for growth you have to allow them training that helps not only the person it help the professional also helps your organization uh and so i think there's you know with some of those things built in uh you can do a lot of work obviously uh, CISA has focused on the uh, the um, uh, the pay piece, which is great. I think it's addressed some of those problems by putting in cyber pay at CISA, uh, making it uh, more enticing to work there. Obviously, they're competing against uh, large name brands and uh, like Google, like Google. <laughs> well, I mean, it is amazing to work here. So you know, uh, what can I say? But. Uh, you know, NSA also has uh, a great recruitment and retention program, right? NSA has almost a best in class within the federal government. They, you know, they allow rotations. They encourage, uh, they encourage training, trying new things. They hire at the entry level. They grow their talent. So it is possible, right? And so, and I think like there's there's pockets of this excellence across the across the world and i think we should take some of those uh best practices and put them into work across the ecosystem because you you know CISA has cyber pay but have they really implemented the rotational part of what yeah. makes nsa hiring so great and retention so great no and so i think we need to we still have work we, we still have work to do and, and room to grow that uh but nothing you know rome wasn't built in a day Right. Uh, well, I and I think myself it's for having a <laughs> out loud. Yep. I'll put it yep. on my bingo card. Yeah, um, we'll see. But... I was, you know, I I said I was cool, right? So obviously, I had to. We had to take it down a notch, false right? That is. <laughs> um, but it's you know your point on job descriptions is is so salient because you know not to sound overly crass, but the amount of times I've worked with organizations on their job descriptions, and frankly, they suck, and it's because people are busy, hiring managers busy, we take one off the shelf and we kind of repurpose it. And at the end of the day, even though it might take extra effort to get them right, what I hear you saying and what I kind of see myself is you have to know where you want to go with those roles before you can create a path or an opening for someone to get into them. I mean, well, I how think else this do you do speaks, it? Right. I think this speaks to the need to develop 
a workforce strategy within your organization, right? If you are, um, if you're a, if you're an organization that's struggling to get cyber talent, which many of them are, uh, you need to think about it strategically. You need to sit down and, and it should be an executive level exercise. This is, I think, one of the areas where it goes wrong. There's not executive level review and investment yeah. into the cyber workforce. Um, and I think that is the level at which this needs to be done. Um, with that, you can do, a, do an assessment. Are these the right people? Where are we going in five years? Where do we want to be in 10 years? And what does that workforce look like that gets us there? Because it's not necessarily the workforce you have today. Uh, and, you know, obviously technology changes. Uh, the, you know, the times change. A pandemic happens. Who predicted that one? Right. So it, like you, you obviously, and it's, it's a hard, it's a hard task for companies. I'm not going to lie. It's not, you know, you have to almost look into a crystal ball and like, but do some, you know, do some data analysis, cyberseek.org plug for them. Amazing work. They have great uh, data points uh, broken out by sector, broken out by, um, broken out by, uh, you know, levels of hiring. So uh, definitely a place to look as a resource as you're trying to do some of this review and analysis for your organizations. Um, I'll also one point, because I mentioned emerging technologies, AI, I think also is definitely a place that will have an impact on the cyber workforce as it will, I think, on, on most of the workforce. Yeah. Um, at Google, obviously, we've uh, been working on and developing AI technologies for more than a decade already. But I think now, you know, there's a really big focus on it and we are, you know, moving ahead boldly but responsibly. And we, you know, but we see opportunities in the in the workforce space, right? For example, how AI can be used in a safe manner. We actually just put out the um, AI safe principles, S-A-I-F. Uh, so you can take a look at those. But the, they, they, think, they talk about how you can actually use the AI to secure your networks and how it can help the defender, right? What defender doesn't have issues, uh, you know, uh, identifying, prioritizing, and addressing the insane number of vulnerabilities that exist and applying patches in a prioritized manner, right? What if we could figure out a way how AI can help that, right? So there's this, some of this toil that a lot of people experience and leads to burnout in the industry yeah. that we can also think creatively about how we can apply AI to help that. So, you know, I think it's, um, there's a lot of opportunity and, um, and I think that, um, you know, we, I think we, we were already looking at, looking at how to apply these things. So, uh, we are, uh, so there's stuff out there at DEF CON, for example, we just did an AI red team. Right. And so we're trying, we're looking at like, you know, uh, we're looking at how not, you know, you're just not just, uh, not just talking about, uh, the, you know, the defense of the past, but what, what it looks like in the future, training those professionals to think about AI, making sure they're engaged, making sure they're uh, aware of the technology, how, how to work with it, how to address and then you utilize the technology uh, to best effect. And, you know, obviously from my perspective to defend our networks and systems. I think um, one of the things that, you know, I'm taking away just given on this conversation is it's really a multifaceted solution and it's part of a broader security strategy. So we have this talent or skills gap. It's not just about finding more people to solve it. Can we use creative technologies? Can we think about the processes and controls that we put in place as we implement frameworks like Zero Trust? It's kind of this whole of strategy that we have to think about as opposed to, to just one. So a really, really great point overall. Absolutely, yeah. Tatiana, thank you so much for joining me today. And I appreciate all of your insights and I'm sure the audience will too. Well, I appreciate you having me on. It was a pleasure.